My name is Cheryl Bender, and it is my pleasure to serve as your host. I'd like to make a couple of quick announcements before we begin. Uh, please make a note of any comments you may have about this session and provide us with valuable feedback on the survey that will be provided to you via the mobile app at the conclusion of the session. Out of courtesy to our speakers and other attendees, please keep your cell phones on silent during the presentation. This session is being recorded for our virtual attendees and 2023 Conference on Demand product, so please be careful to try and keep noise at a bare minimum. If you have a question during the presentation, please raise your hand so that I can come to you with a microphone. This one. Okay. This will allow our virtual viewers to hear you. If you need to leave early, uh, please exit quietly without interrupting the presentation. To obtain information about HR cert uh, certification for SHRM and HRCI for attending, please refer to the session descriptions in the event app. Okay. Uh, and with that, I am pleased to introduce you to our speaker today, Lauren Epstein. Uh, Lauren Epstein, MSOD, and SHRM SCP is a social scientist, keynote, and Vistage speaker who trains and consults with senior leaders on methods to improve decision making through, through reducing unconscious bias. Over 14,000 professionals have taken his workshops. Epstein's research focuses on improving decision making ROI by reducing unconscious bias in the workplace. He has been quoted in Forbes, Cosmopolitan, Christian Science Monitor, and other publications. His 2021 Bias Impact Report has been downloaded over 1,000 times. Good deal. His book, You're Hired, Interview Skills to Get the Job, has been downloaded over half a million times. Lauren has been leading experiential workshops since 1993 and has been an HR professional since 1996. As a leader in talent acquisition, he built recruiting teams in the US, India, and Brazil. He is a lifetime charter member of the Association of Talent Acquisition Professionals. Lauren Epstein. Thank you. Thank you. Big hand for our volunteers. So your volunteers, is our audio on? Is our audio on? Your volunteers make this conference. I do a lot of these, and it totally makes a difference. So I just acknowledge the folks that come here, hang out, spend their time for no pay, and they're usually unseen, but they, I really appreciate them. So my name is Lauren Epstein, and uh, we are going to have uh, an experience of developing an ethical mindset. So we're going to talk about ethics. You want to come up close because you're going to be breaking up into groups. And my, my commitment, the reason I do this, is that it matters to me what your workplace is like, right? That your workplace is safe, it's consistent, it's in alignment, right? There's, there's concurrence, like what people are saying and what people are doing are in alignment. And so that's all the work that I do. I'm a social scientist by profession, but I do these workshops and other work as my, so my avocation is my profession. This is not like other workshops you've been to. This isn't casual, um, but we have some goals, right? So our main goal, well, no, excuse me, how you be here. So as your facilitator, I want to make sure you get the most value because we're going to be here, and I want to make sure you get the most value. So it's a special invitation. So one, be here open. So what do you think that means to you? What does be here open mean? Willing to learn, absolutely. And what about experiment? What does experiment mean? What does experiment mean to you? There's no right answer. Yeah, trying something. And then what? Yeah, see if it's valid. Right, exactly. So all the things that we're talking about here, I'm not you know, giving you facts or stuff that's written on a tablet, right? It's really you doing the work. I'm going to create the context. I'm going to give you some things to do. But you're going to only learn by doing the work. I can't do it for you. So there's going to be a lot of work, a lot of exercises. I'll explain some things, but mostly it's going to be about you doing work. And what does that mean? <laughs> if you personally gave me a check for $100,000, how would you be here? Very present, right? Yeah, yeah. Anyone else? What does that mean if you gave me a check for $100,000? Attentive. Now look, you're going to be here anyway, so be here like that. And not just from my workshops, but from your learning journey today. Because you're going to be here. And I said this yesterday, and it, it really kind of it's impactful for me. In three years, SHRM takes away our credits. They're gone. But they cannot take away what you learn. 
That is yours and yours alone. So we are going to examine ethics so that you can write an ethical statement. That's the purpose of this workshop. Now, this is usually a two-hour workshop. We're just doing one hour. But we'll do a lot so that you can write, or you can write one. Ethics is about right and wrong behavior. But what's right and what's wrong? Well, that can be debatable, right? Things that were right in the past are wrong now, and vice versa, right? Yes? Do you agree? Cool. So why would we consider our ethics? Why do we consider our ethics? I mean, you're all here for ethics, right? Yeah, why do we consider it? To make the right judgment. And what does that mean for a future tense? Like, to change, right? To change how you think about ethics. Come on in. You're going to need to sit next to a couple of people because we're going to break out into groups, so make sure you're sitting next to two or three people. Yeah, so improvement requires action. So you can have this great experience today, OK? And some of you are going to be like, well, that's great. My organization is not going to do anything about it. And I'm just going to, that was great. I got my one credit. Yay. Right? That's fine. And there are folks who are watching this. They may be able to be here. Or you can see how you can take this and start applying it to your lives, to your families, to your workplace. Because ethics occurs everywhere. If you have questions during this workshop, please feel free to stop me. Welcome. Come on in. So what does that mean, ethics is challenging? When I say that, what do you think that means? OK, we're going to do a little test just to make sure everyone's functioning, because sometimes you know, there's ableism. Not everyone's able to do everything. So let's make sure everyone is able to do this. Can everyone do this? Raise your hand if you can do this. Awesome. So I think, thank you, everyone, most people went to high school in America, I'm guessing. And this is a function of how dysfunctional high school is. Because when you go to high school and you raise your hand, you know the answer. What do they call you? Smarty pants. And if you raise your hand and you don't know the answer, what do they call you? How safe is that to raise your hand? <laughs> you're either smarty pants or you're dummy. Right? No room for learning. So here, I will not judge you. I accept you as you are. You're perfect, completely capable adults. There is nothing that I actually have to teach you. I'm just going to focus your mind on something that you already know and give you a couple of tools. So ethics is challenging. So you're going to break up in your groups of like three or four now. So get up, not two, but three or four at least. And I want you to just introduce yourselves, because you're going to work together for a little bit. This is going to be your work group for the next 50 some odd minutes. So just go quickly, do this, just take a minute. Just your name, your job title, and really, why, why would having an ethical mindset help you? OK? And go. Don't worry about it. Don't, don't, just leave him for now. Yeah, just stay focused on the exercise. Just leave him there. Did you guys come together? Oh, OK, great. There you go. Just leave him here for now. You'll need him later. OK, bring that to a close. Start wrapping that up. Start wrapping that up. OK, so who would like to share uh, why they're here? What's an ethical mindset? Who wants to answer the third question publicly? Who wants to take a chance and get 100 bonus points? Who wants 100 bonus points? Yeah. Um, would you stand up? Yeah. What's your name? I'm Liz. Uh, Liz. Let's give Liz a big round of applause, being the first person to stand up. Uh, oh, there's a microphone. Oh my goodness. So Liz, what would having an ethical mindset help you with? I think having an ethical mindset 
is important, not just in your professional life, but in your personal life. Um, really practicing these types of habits lead to good things, no matter where you're at. Got it, good things, wonderful. Thank you, give her a round of applause. Thank you. Um, can you join the group, I'm sorry, what's your name? Lori. Lori, can you join this group back here? Sure. That's gonna be your work group. Great, so, so write things. Um, so you have a workbook and we're gonna be working with that. You don't have to look at it now. But why do ethical statements matter, right? Why is it important to know the difference between right and wrong, or good or bad? Provides a safe place. Provides a safe place, yeah. How about risk, right? I mean, you're all HR professionals here? Who here, raise your hand if you like risk. Yeah, exactly, you're like the risk terminators. You go around your offices and like kill risk wherever it lives. So risk, fundamentally, is what we think is good or bad or right or wrong, which is what ethics is. So if we can get on the same page about what we think good or bad is, and I know what you know, and we agree about what's good or bad, then how are we gonna be with ethics? How are we gonna be? What are you thinking? Yeah, if, if we're on the same page with right and wrong, like. Yeah, but we'll be on the same page about ethics. Yeah. I'll know the guardrails for ethics, right? So when we think about ethics, it's like, here's the road, and your ethics are the guardrails on either side. There's a lot of room in the middle, right, that's safe to be in. But you don't want to go over the guardrail. Because then what? We have risk. We have problems. And this is changing, right? I mean, it's changing not just in our laws, but how we communicate, how we treat one another, and it changes over time, right? So guidance when you're faced with ethical dilemmas. Somebody did something that violated the policies. What do we do? That could be an ethical dilemma, right? Because you know, do, we, do we fire them? Do we, what do we do, right? And so that's part of this, right? Usually when I ask questions, they're up there, but that's okay, you can just, whatever you're thinking. Fundamentally, it's about raising your awareness. So what's awareness? Does anyone have a sense of what awareness means? Knowledge. Knowledge. What else? You were going to say something. Well, you're aware of what's right and wrong, but you're paying attention. Paying attention. Very good. So think about these two concepts. You have and I have consciousness. You've heard of that, consciousness. Imagine the consciousness, as an example, is the carpet on this floor. That is your entire consciousness. Awareness is focusing a flashlight on this one section. That's awareness. We're paying attention, we're thinking about this one thing, because your consciousness is vast. It's vast, you have years of experience, years of knowledge. It's not always coming to you, our brain doesn't work that way. We focus on the thing, right? So when we say awareness, if you elevate your level of awareness, then you're aware of more. Then that, that flashlight gets broader and broader and broader, and you can consider more and you can see more, you can hear more, and you can speak with more love, more compassion, and more effectiveness. Does that resonate for you? Are we all on the same page? Am I, raise your hand if you're with me. Great. So why does this matter to D and I, right? So let's take a look at this. So when we have us and them, othering, we know that word, right? We have racism, sexism, violence, that is a lower level of awareness. And you know this because over the last, particularly three years, our level of awareness has just shot through the roof, right? Since George Floyd was murdered, we are thinking about these things in ways we'd never thought about before. I mean, I never had so many companies call me and say, my CEO wants to do something. Like, that's never happened, right? So that's a level of awareness. It's not, it's not about personalities, right? It's about, it's about awareness, right? This is not a people thing. This is a brain thing, right? We can't always be aware of everything. And so the greater level of awareness, what do we have more of? What do we have more of if we have greater awareness? Diversity. Yeah, diversity, absolutely, right? And so I'm making this, so the point of me saying this, if you'd understand, when we talk about ethics, this is one of the byproducts, okay? This is one of the byproducts. So context, okay. So what is context? What does context mean? History. History, that's good. What else is context? Information. 
The, I'm sorry, wait, what? Background? The relationship between things? So the definition I'm going to give you for context is like the ground that we walk on, the metaphorical ground that we walk on. So what's that? A beach. OK, what, what, can go, what can grow on a beach? What kind of plants? Palm trees, maybe, right? But a certain kind of plants can grow on a, on a desert, right? Can those plants grow in a jungle? No, different context. What plants grow in a jungle? Can they grow on a desert or on a, on a beach? No. So the context is really important. And the reason we're talking about context is that's the first thing that we need to be clear about when we're creating our ethics. What is the context? What's the ground that we're walking on? Because what the ground is that we're walking on, it changes the context. Right? So for example, anyone know what that is? Just a guess? D-Day. Very good. 2,000 bonus points. That's D-Day. That's the beach at Normandy. Okay? That's June 6, 1944. Allied forces land on Normandy Beach. What was the context of that beach that day? It's really clear. What's the context of that beach? Storm the beach, but to do what? War. The context of that beach that day was war. Unde like, undeniable. You look at it. That's a war beach. That, that beach was creating war. But that's the beach today. What happened? What's that beach? Creating. What's the context of that beach? Relaxation, serenity, right? So context of the space can change. It can change. So you can go into a space and change the context, right? You've been to a great party that didn't go so well, or a party that was kind of slow and then got great. That's changing the context. You guys didn't leave the space, but the context changed. And you, you all know how to set context. When you get dressed up and you go to work, you are a context. When you're with your family and friends, you are a context. And you can explore, like we only have an hour, right? So we're going to go kind of quick, but explore what, you, what your context is. Because that's what you bring. And it's important to know what the context is because this concept of ethics is so squishy. Right and wrong is so squishy. We have to be really clear what we mean when we say it and in what context. So this is an ethical slogan. Do you know who wrote that one? What company? Very good. Who said that? 2,000 bonus points. That's Google in like 2005. OK? In 2015, so don't be evil. What does don't be evil mean? Now we're talking about ethics. What does don't be evil mean? Because evil is like a bad, right? Malicious? Cruel? Inspiring somebody evil? Depends. Depends, right? Yeah. Is buying another company evil? It depends. Yeah, exactly. Is co-opting a government-funded experiment calling the internet and making sure that all of the people who use it go to your website, is that, is that evil? <laughs> There's what? It might be, yeah. Sometimes things aren't inherently so. Right? But we've already, I've heard people say it depends. It depends, right? I, I'm Jewish, so I'm going to tell you that if you want like four opinions, ask two rabbis. Right? Because it all depends. So now they're in 2015, it says what? What does that mean? What does do the right thing mean? <laughs> what does it mean? This is the work part of the workshop. Remember I said I invited you to be here in a certain way, like you were giving me $100,000. You're going to take whatever you learn away with you. So the opportunity here is to think, what does do the right thing mean? I think, what, I think sort of it's for me, but I don't know who defines right. Thank you. What's your name? Andrew said, I don't know who defines right. Right? We don't know who defines right. Right. That's the point. That's it. Nobody, who's, de who's defining it? Now, it doesn't matter when we create an ethical statement if we do it in the way that we're all in agreement with it. We're all in agreement. So we all know what it means. And we're all OK. We all bought in, right? 
There was a time on this planet where if someone caused harm to somebody else, there were no repercussions. They didn't have agreement about it. Now there's agreement, right? There's systems in place to, to kind of mitigate that. No, no, right? Because we can have, like in my house, we have agreements. Do you have agreements in your house? So in your house, is there the right thing and the wrong thing to do? Is that the same for everyone? No, same thing, right? It's what works. And, and you're going to see that creating an ethical framework, creating understanding ethics is really about what works. So that's an ethical statement. We're just going to go through these quickly because there's a lot of work to do. So who do you think wrote that? Who wants to read it? Because it's kind of interesting. Who wants to read it out loud? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, was that? Oh. They're miking you. Associates are expected to operate based on our high standards and values. Respect, service, excellence, and integrity. Acting consistently with, the, with these values demands that a culture of integrity guides all our decisions. Thank you. What company? Guess. For a million bonus points. Nobody wants to guess? So afraid of being wrong? Walmart. Right. Yeah. See? OK, wait. So we have a comment here. So, so go ahead, say what you said. I said it's the opposite of what they do. It's the opposite of what they do. So is there agreement about this at the company? No. So whoever wrote it didn't get buy-in, didn't get agreement, didn't get everyone saying, this is our ethics. I'll give you this last one. Who wants to read it? And the blank is the name of the company. That's why it's blank. Read it out loud. Someone read it out loud. I'll read it out loud. This company conducts business ethically, honestly, and in full compliance with the law. We believe that how we conduct ourselves is, a critical, is, critical, is as critical to our success as making the best products in the world. Our business conduct and compliance policies are foundational to how we do business and how we put our values into practice every day. What company? Right? Yeah. Apple. Right? Now, the question here now is that you're going to be putting these things out there, and you want to make sure that it's in alignment. And, and whether you agree with it or not isn't so much the point. Is do people, do your stakeholders, are they acting that way? Right? Those are the people that matters. HIPAA. HIPAA is a great ethical statement, right? I mean, it's medical ethics. It's medical ethics. That is ethics. Right? You're all familiar with HIPAA. Privacy statements. That's ethics. Privacy statements are ethics. Sometimes there's laws, but mostly it's ethics, because that's just how it is. All right, so why does it matter? OK, so this data is from uh, the state of ethics and compliance in the workplace. So when we look at it, we see from 2017 to 2020, observed management lying to employees went up. Observed conflicts of interest went up 8%. Observed improper hiring practices 10%. This is just in a three-year period. All ob ob observed abusive behaviors went up. Oh, and by the way, a lot of this stuff is in the handout. So at the end, there's a QR code. You can download it. I want you to know this stuff. All this stuff I'm talking about is cited in literature. So I'm, I'm an academic. It's all like you can read the papers. You can read the books. The information is free. This isn't the world according to me. So when we look at this, you know, 79% of employees don't experience a strong ethical culture. The, the line is how many people actually do. So it kind of went up in 2007, 2009, and then it went down, and it's like at 20 percent. 80 percent of people don't feel like they work in an ethical place. That's a problem, right? Because what do we say ethics in increases as HR professionals? Diversity and inclusion and Equity and belonging and risk is risk. So I'm a really big fan, and I'll talk about it more, that whatever we do in this space has got to be attached to your business's goals, to your organization's goals. And if it's not, I'll tell you why. Because if the winds change and money goes away, your program will go away. But if you attach what you're doing to the operational fo focus of the business, it will stay and it'll become part of the culture. 
Don't make what you're doing in this space an event. You will lose it. You will lose it without a doubt. Maybe not this year, maybe not next year, but absolutely, programs are always getting cut. But if it's part of the business, if you can show the leadership and the people that are operating in, the, in your space that if we don't do this, we're not going to make enough money, or if we don't do this, our service delivery is, not gonna, is going to be impaired. Right? All businesses are doing something that's countable. Any questions on that? So where do your ethics come from? So I can tell you, I was born in the 60s to a single mom in Brooklyn, and my ethics was totally framed in that. Totally. You know, I, I think as a youth, I was more, the ends justified the means. I think that was my personal philosophy. The ends justify the means, right? That's not my philosophy now, it's not my ethics now, but that, that's what occurred. So what I want you to do is turn to your group, and you're gonna get a minute. So those who came late, get yourself in a group. So if you're not in a group, better find a group. And, uh, and talk about where ethics came from, where you got your ethics. Go ahead. So I'm, these are the questions you want to, so the questions that are up on the board are the ones you can discuss. Okay, cool. We didn't get, I don't think we got a memo. Yeah, you did. Don't worry. I got you taken care of. Oh, you did? Okay. I, I promise you, I <laughs> will take care of you. Okay, I just didn't like you've want never been. You don't have to worry about that. Okay. You can let that thing go about missing out. I will take care of you. Thank That's you. on my hands. You will. I know. Thank you. You guys done? Okay. Start to bring that to a close. Start to bring that to a close. Okay, so anybody want to share um, one of the ones or twos? Raise your hand if you want to share publicly. Yeah, would you stand up, please? Hi, Patty. Hi. Hi. Okay, cool, awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> Raise your hand if that's true for you. Yeah, true for a lot of people, absolutely. So the purpose of this is just for you to start elevating and seeing where your ethics come from and hear where other people's ethics comes from and there's a difference, right? There's just a difference because we all have different ethics. So, espoused ethics versus lived ethics. What does that mean? Yes, two million bonus points. What you say versus what you do. And look, I'll be the first one to tell you, I don't live all my ethics. I can be really judgmental. I can, you know, like, and, and not like always in a conscious way, not really in a conscious way, but in an unconscious way, right? I just don't think for whatever reason. So we're all like that, right? So how people think things should be versus how they behave. So when you write your ethical frameworks and you think about ethics, I want you to consider this because there's got to be alignment, right? There's got to be concurrence. Thank you. There's got to be concurrence or if you write like our ethics is that no one ever does anything that hurts anyone or breaks any rules or like would that work? Why? Okay, people mess up, right? So that's great. People are imperfect. They're going to make mistakes. So if you write an ethical statement, what does it have to have room for? Error. Human. Humanity. People. Right? Somebody makes a mistake, you know, you can't just fire people. I mean, well, great story. Uh, so there's this guy. He's a, 
I know we do. There's this guy, it was kind of, it's my cousin. There was a man who was in law school and he was looking for an internship. So he finds this law firm where this woman who's like going to be his like law, they're about the same age, but she's working there and he's an intern. And he says to her after a while, hey, would you like to go out with me? And she says, no. And he asks her again. And she says, no. And he asks her again. And she says, no. And finally, one day, she said, yes. And they got married. And that is Michelle and Barack Obama. <laughs> right? So, so was that ethical for him to do that? Right? There, maybe there was no framework. But in some places today, now, that would be a problem. And that wasn't that long ago. Right? That wasn't that long ago. Right? So the larger the difference between espoused and lived ethics, the greater the confusion or misunderstanding. So if you have an ethical statement and people say this is the way it is here, and people don't understand that, you get confusion. And if you have confusion, people don't follow. That People want leadership. Most people just want to know, well, what's the game? What are the rules? Right? Every game you play has rules. If you don't know it works, there's rules. And you want to make sure people understand that. OK, so now you're going to have a, so you have handouts. It should be right next to you. Just make sure everyone's got one. I want you to read the scenario. The scenario. It says ethical simulation. Read it. And then you're going to discuss the consequences and consider the ethics. So read it. Take a minute and read it together. Or read yours. And then you're going to work on it together in your little work group. Thank you for the hot water. When you're done, start discussing what you think was right, what you think was wrong, what do you see, what don't you see, what resonates for you. There's no right or wrong answers here. Why? It's ethics, right? And see what it's like discussing this with other peers. What's that conversation like? Right? Notice that. And so later or afterwards, I want you to like take note of that, either if you have a journal or just make a note. Like, what was it like having an ethical conversation with people who I didn't know? Well, you come together as adults and have a conversation about ethics. Because when you go someplace else, like home or your house of worship or work, you can do the same thing. Right? So that's part of the mastery. I believe 100% you all have agency to create ethics in your life and to live a more ethical life. You have that. I don't need to teach you that. It's the practice. It's the practice. So we're, we're practicing. This is an introduction. And I want you to practice this. The invitation is I want you to practice this everywhere you go. Think about it. Think about what are the ethics. Like, well, how does that really work? So you can start talking if everyone's done. Uh, and you can take notes on your paper. There's a section for notes. And you'll take about, uh, about 10 minutes or so. Yeah. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. What? What, sir?
Uh, my apologies. I did not. I was not aware that you were here, and didn't know that you needed to see this. So I, I put up the doc. I'm not talking to you guys. This is the online people only. So the ethical uh, statement, the the um, simulation is up on the board. You should be able to see it. And given that you're not in a group, just start thinking about your own response to it and write it. Write it down on a piece of paper or um, you know, write it on your computer and start thinking about it. And unfortunately, I don't think we can interact with one another, but I just want to acknowledge your presence. Thank you for being here. I apologize, I did not know that you were in the room. You have a nice smile. You have a nice smile. Like your whole face smiles. Yeah, you have facial expressions.
want to start making notes. Like write this space there to write notes on your thing. So you want to start writing like what you're coming up with. So start grounding some stuff. Whatever it is. There's, again, there's no right or wrong there. There's just an experimentation. Okay, bring that to a close. Bring that to a close. So does anyone want to share like, what they came up with or their thinking? Uh, just raise your hand. And, and we're trying to figure out, the folks who are online, we're trying to figure out if we can communicate with you. So we're trying to open up a channel. And when we do, we'll, we'll take questions or comments. So anybody want to uh, share what, they, what their group noticed, what came up? Anyone have a thought? Did you guys talk about anything? Was this recipe sharing? <laughs> yes. Take the microphone so everyone can hear. The microphone's not on. Hello? Hello? Yep. Okay. Uh, the one thing that I was just thinking about, I didn't actually discuss it in the group, sorry guys. But the one thing I was just thinking about is the Katie situation, right? So really helping to coach that manager of understanding perception and understanding like, you know, how to really heal the relationship and, and how important healing that relationship is. Great, okay, just freeze there. So based on what, what's your name? Jennifer. Based on what Jennifer said, and let's just say this is Jennifer, what are her ethics based on what she just said? What matters to her, what's ethical? Trust, Trust. what else? Growth. Growth, the R word. Relationship. Relationship. So that would be something in your ethical statement. So what nice. you started out, the whole thing I heard, relationship, 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 mm -hmm. right? Did you guys hear that too? Yeah, thank you. Thank Who you. else wants to? So yeah, give her a round of applause, <laughs> of course. It feels good, right? So anybody else want to share? And so what we're doing now is I want you to distinguish when you hear the words, what's the ethical framework? What's the ethics behind that? What's the context? What's the ground that that actually is communicating, right? Remember we talked about context, right? So when I say, hey, we're going to make sure that this person gets a coach so that they are so amazing at, at, at dealing with people. Context is relationship, right? It's not about getting coached about this thing. The context is relationship. Because if the context is about relationship, then of course she's going to be great with relationship, right? But something's out. Something's out. And what's out is that, that piece. And so we put it in. But if we're going to have an ethical statement, relationships got to be in it, right? So who else wants to share? Yeah. I think we agree that there needs to be more information validated, right, in regards to this situation. But so a question, just a question I have is, how do we determine who is right and wrong in this situation? Right. We talk about perception. We talk about saying that perception is reality. Sometimes, if I'm being honest, some, that, that statement sometimes bugs me because I don't think. If, if Sarah, right, Sarah acted in such a way that, that, the, that the employee felt that way, I think that, that's something we need to deal with, right? But does that can we, can we absolutely say that Sarah's behaviors were wrong 
because the so because the employee walked away with a certain feeling. Yeah. So you're asking me or telling me? I'm asking you. Yeah. Because I don't. How, do, how we, do we? I don't know what you can do. Yeah. But I mean, again, what I would say is, what was the wrong behavior for you in this situation? Yeah. Was that the uh, that the employee walked away with a feeling that that they were doing more than they were required to and being Great, held wait, account? Wait, wait. Yep. The employee walked away with a feeling that 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 they were doing more, that they were being held accountable for something that's not in their job description. Exactly. Yeah. So if you wanted to prevent that, what would be the ethics? What would be an ethical statement to, to not have that happen? Well, we've got to revisit the job description. OK, yeah. so what's the, what's the context of having clear job descriptions? Communication. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Communication and agreement. Communication and agreement. That's got to be in your ethical statement. Do you see that now? Yeah, so that's the learning, right? It's like, what are we going to put in our ethical statements? It's not about who's right and who's wrong, but what's the context of what we're thinking and feeling and sensing into this? Anyone else? I'll take one more. Is this helpful? Okay, good. One more? Or not? Pregnant pause for dramatic effect. See who's feeling courageous. Oh, okay, there we go, right here. What's your name? Serena. Serena, would you stand up? Sure. So, Serena, yes. thank you. Give her a round of applause. Thank you. So, what, what did you think was right and wrong here, or whatever? Well, the, the wrong that being done was the harming of the, or the, the harm from, to, from the manager to the employees. Great, stop right there. So, what would you say is the value that you have, the ethical value you have around that? So, it's how to treat people. How to treat people. So what's the, the word we said earlier? Relationships. Relationships. Yeah. Right. So that's the thing that's out for you, mm -hmm. this relationship thing, mm -hmm. right? So in your ethical framework, what would you include? Understanding that relationships, I guess, should be positive, maybe? Or well, not positive, right? Because that's not really that's true. clear, it right? That's true. It doesn't need but, to be that way. But yeah. you're close. Respectful? We would not teach really. people how to be in relationship with each other. Okay. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Like, we're together, and we've been having a great time. We are in agreement about how we're going to treat each other. Right? We're in agreement. Right. No one's gotten harmed. Anybody get harmed? No. See? Right? So we're in agreement. Consciously or unconsciously, we're in agreement because of the context. Right? So if, you're, if a lot of that's happening in your space, like a lot of that thing, it's usually the same thing that's happening, because that context is deep. Right, that's very strong, the context. So if somebody's getting harmed in a certain way or there's something you think is out of eth outside the ethical boundaries, it's happening other places. And you may not see it. So you can, it's, it's good to look at the theme. Thank you, thank you, Serena. Give her a round of applause if you offer it. It's good to look at the themes to see what's out. Because not every place is different. Some places it might be one thing, some places it might be another. So this is in your handout, right? But these are just kind of like um, foundations. That's why it says foundation. So when you think about creating your ethical framework, you got to be thinking about these things, right? Is it legal? Does it meet people's needs? Because that's what we were doing, right? You were talking in your small group, but you'd have this group and have this conversation, right? Have this conversation of like, does privacy matter to us? Does consent matter to us? You know, when I do my work and I engage with people, I usually ask for permission. Right? Because that's one of my ethics. Like, I got to ask permission. Right? So, group considerations, right? Simple, doable, actionable steps. That's one of my favorites. Again, you got to bake this into what people are already doing. If you make it outside of that scope, then it's like, I roll, please. Right? Another HR thing. Right? You got to bake it into the business. That's why it may not be 100%. Your ethical framework may not cover everything. It really shouldn't, right? But if it covers something, then you're there. You're on the field. So these are in your handouts. OK, should and shall. So this is one of my favorite, right? So what does should mean? What does should mean? In an ideal world, this is what we would like for. Exactly. This should happen in an ideal world. And it's really good for ethics. Why? Well, it says it there. Uncertainty, 
right? Ethics is uncertain. When we first started talking about it, everyone's like, depends. Depends, right? So it's very context-based. Because one context, the ethics is one way, and another context, the ethics is another way. And they could be completely opposed, diametrically opposed. In, in my workplace, no one gives anybody orders. But if I was in the army, well, that's what you do, right? Okay, shall, right, creates certainty in the future. It creates a very, like, this shall happen. But what do we know when we, we get those guardrails really close, like that close? What happens when the guardrails are as big as my body? What happens? I, bro I go over them, because there's no room to make any mistakes or to experiment or to try something, right? So when we think about these things, should is a really powerful word, right? When we talk about them, it should be should. Does that make any, does that resonate? Yeah. Right, I'm giving you a couple of words so that when you start framing up your thing that you, you have something to think about, right? Words matter, this is all, all this stuff is in the context of language. So, where are we on time? Great, okay. So you're not gonna find doing this any easier than anybody else. I am not an expert on ethics. Every human being is as competent on ethics as everybody else. Your knowledge, your experience, this one hour workshop, read books, doesn't make you any better at actually applying it. It doesn't, right? I mean, I still challenge myself with ethics every day. I, I see my ethics. I make decisions and I'm like, is this ethical? Sometimes I do things and I go, nope, it's not ethical, but I'm gonna do it anyway. That's what happens sometimes. I'm gonna do it anyway, and I'm gonna see. See how it resonates. So, but for me, and, I, and, and, and um, you know, I wanna give this, actually, give this, mm, this example, right? So, I, I wanna talk a little bit more about the why from a personal side. So, one of the reasons we wanna have ethics, we talked about all the reasons, like risk and, and all those things, but individually, we all have what's called integrity. Right? And so I'm just going to say integrity in this definition is like wholeness and completeness. If you think about a ship, like a boat, if it's in integrity, there's no holes in it. If it's out of integrity, there's a hole in it. You don't want a hole in a ship because then it sinks. So if this was my integrity and I said, Patty, um, we're gonna, I'm going to get you that report at 9 o'clock in the morning on Monday and it's 10 o'clock and I didn't do it, what happens is that part of my ethics goes away. My, actually, part of my integrity goes away, right? Or if I say, hey, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna meet you for coffee at 12 o'clock and I don't show up till one, another part of my integrity goes away, right? So what's happening? What's happening here? What's, the, what's this metaphor selling you? You're losing your own integrity, right? And the people around you are like, see that you're losing your integrity. And they treat you that way, right? So when we have this, we can keep our integrity. Right? No, no one's perfect, right? We, but we can keep our integrity. And that, again, that's the, does that make sense? Is that a good, you, okay, good, good. Good. Great, so we got about six minutes. So this is like point zero, like the starting line. It's like you're at the starting line, you're at the gate. Right? We haven't really done the real work, right? But you can take this, you can use this, the handout, and if you wanna download the handout and get more stuff, take this and just experiment with yourself, right? Just practice with yourself. You don't have to talk to anybody. You know what's ethical now, you know what's not, you know what your integrity is, you know how it feels, right? How does it feel to be in integrity? How does it feel to keep your word? Yeah, that's, keeping, that's one way to be in integrity, right? It feels good to keep my word. I got that thing done, nine o'clock, boom. Right, feels good. So integrity lives in our bodies too. You know when you're in integrity and you know when you're out, right? You know it. If I have to tell you that, you're adults. You've had this experience. And to create a context of ethics, you gotta give something up. It's that kind of transaction. It's not a, you can have more. Right? So what do you give up when you have ethics? What do you give up? You give up being right about people. Huh? Comfort? You give up comfort. 
you're going to be in the uncomfortable place. But you give up being right about people, about being right about yourself, or wrong about yourself. Because when we look at things from this perspective, it's not about the personality. It's not about you as a person or your style. Right? It's about coming up with adult agreements that we all are in alignment with. Right? And alignment is different than, and I said agreement, but really alignment is not agreement. Right? You want to be in alignment. Alignment is like we're all in alignment behind that thing. You may not agree with it, but we're in alignment. I got some rules in my house I have to be in alignment with that I don't agree with. But I have a wife, and I'm a smart husband, so I just do it. <laughs> so I said this earlier, and you know, here's where I'm kind of nailing this. Everything that you do, you're going to go back to work, and you're going to take the stuff that you've learned this week, and you're going to say, OK, I'm going to do this. If you do not attach it to a number, it's going to be an event. So this is real data. I'm not showing off. I'm just showing you how I do it. This data here represents people doing my bias workshop from a client. And I test them before and after the workshop. And I measure a 19% increase in their confidence in handling bias in the workplace. I measured it. I counted. I'm a social scientist and a researcher. I count for a living. I told my nephew that. He's like, that's it? That's it. I count. Right? So I can count. I can count. So here's another example. So this is a client of mine, Pocket Nurse. They're an e-commerce company that sells stuff to teach nurses how to be nurses. They're in a little brown, unnoticeable un un building in Pennsylvania. And I work with their DEI group for about seven months. And we came up with some interventions. And one of the four. And one of the interventions was this. So they took this park, and they did that. And they fixed up the playground, and they did all these things. But here's the thing. It wasn't just a good thing. They're in a building in the middle of Pennsylvania nobody knows. The community doesn't know. So they had this event, and all these kids came out. And guess what? These kids are going to need jobs one day. So where are they going to go? Pocket nurse. So what does this do? This helps the top of the funnel. They can hire people in their community and not have to worry about moving people in, that kind of thing. They now have impacted a business function, which is recruiting. See that? So we attached what they did. And this was great. This is great for inclusion. This is great for other things. But there was a business result. So we're just wrapping up, and I'll take some questions. We have a couple of minutes. So the QR code on the left is the workshop handout. And the QR code on the right, so I've been doing, so in 2021, I did a bias impact report. I'm doing it again. I've got about 500 data sets. I'm going to release it at the June Sherm conference. This card here, this QR code, allows you to take that survey. I would like you to take the survey. I'd like you to share this with your friends and have them take the survey. What we're doing is we're measuring where in the workplace bias is the biggest problem, what companies are doing to resolve it, and what examples of best practices to the companies are doing. And we're going to create the change management documents and make those freely available to everyone. This is my contribution back to my community and my world because I want to make it just a little bit better. So I, and I do these, so I have clients who want to have this done for their own companies, which we do. Um, and of course, I do this for a living. And if I come back and I get paid, my wife lets me in the house. So <laughs> that's really important. So um, yeah, and then my content. Any questions, comments, before we officially, they're going to shut the lights and kick us out? <laughs> I have a question. Do you think, um, do you think that it's possible if you have been asked by management to do something that violates your own ethics and even violates company ethics and possibly the law, <laughs> is there any way back from that? Is there any way of fostering ethics and continuing to just do the right thing that will create like a cultural change in the company? Mm. So I'm gonna speak from my personal experience. So I was, maybe a little still, a make a difference addict. Wherever I went, I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to make things better. And I was addicted to it. And um, you know, the truth is, is that it doesn't really work. It doesn't really work. I, I can't, so I haven't changed anyone's minds here. The, the best I can do is create a context that's inviting, that you step into, that you step into, hmm. right? So you can't go and tell your boss, blah, 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 unless you can, but likely not. And so if somebody has um, an ethical framework that is out of alignment with yours, then you can look within and see, well, how does this impact your ethics? And I mean, I, 
I just want to say, I mean, just not as a lawyer, but if someone's breaking the law, that's a whole different thing, mm -hmm. right? There's laws. So laws are different than ethics, okay? Laws are, this is how it is, right? Ethics, a little squishier. So uh, I don't have a really good answer for you, but I just want to share my own experience. Did I help? Maybe not. Just want you to know, I'm being video recorded, so I, <laughs> I am a little sensitive. Like, if you and I were hanging out in a bar, it'd be a whole different conversation. Yeah, because I'm from Brooklyn, too, so yeah. I mean. Yeah. yeah, so afterwards, you can talk. Okay. <laughs> but, you know, I'm only going to tell you my experience, but maybe in some language that we can both, a little more colorful. Anyone else? But it's a good question in that I think it's important to see that distinction because we, we think we can change things and, you know, yes, no, right? We can change ourselves. That's why all this work that I do is for you with you. I mean, if you do this work, then you can change how you see the world. You can activate your agency. You have agency. You know how to create integrity. You know how to create ethics. I'm just saying, use it. Use it. Build the muscle of creating this so that wherever you go, you are in alignment with your own integrity. And you know, I gotta tell you, when people are out of integrity and they're not ethical, it, there's a physiological impact. Your brain actually causes disease. It's unbelievably scary what happens when you're, when, it's just, it causes disease, real disease. Not made up disease, real stuff. Anyone else? Oh my God, I'm zero, zero, zero. So I, I'm gonna hang out. I don't think there's another workshop here. I'll hang out for a while. I'm doing uh, my workshop on uncovering unconscious bias at 1.15. You're welcome to come. So even if you didn't sign up for it, just come. You know, there's always room. I appreciate you. And I say, I say this to HR folks more than anyone else. I know the seat that you're in. And I believe that out of all the people in an organization, you can have the biggest impact on the personal lives of human beings. And those people that you have an impact on, they go home. And they have an impact on their families, and on the dog, and the cat, and the neighbors, and the house of worship. You have that power. You need to know that what I appreciate is, but you have that power to make a difference for a lot of people. And you may never see it. Likely, you'll never see it. When you're in the business of like making a difference, you generally never see this stuff, right? It's like, it's like um, uh, what's the movie, the guy sees the three ghosts at Christmas? No, 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 no. The, the Wonderful Life, Wonderful Life, right? It's like that, right? We're all kind of living a wonderful life. Like, we're all making a difference, but we don't always see it. So I want you to know that I see it. And I acknowledge you for it. And really acknowledge you. Like, acknowledge yourselves for what you do. Because truthfully, you make a difference in people's lives in a very big way. So that's my gift. I'll hang around. Go have a great rest of your, the day. Learn. Like I said earlier, they can take away your credits, but they can't take away your knowledge. <laughs>